Good morning. Today we have the honor of interviewing Professor Varasa Otsula. Dr. Otsula is a cardiothoracic surgeon at Moi University in Eldor, Kenya. He was first born in Busia, Kenya, and where he was the eldest of more than 40 children. And then he attended several primary schools, but ultimately attended Narok High School, where he sat for the Cambridge School Certificate. Dr. Otsula um, attended the University of Nairobi, where he obtained a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery degree. And thereafter, he did his post-medical training at Kenyatta Hospital. Following that, he studied cardiothoracic surgery at Birmingham, England, before returning back to Kenyatta Hospital, where he restarted a cardiac surgery program. Professor Otsula then joined the Department of Surgery at Moy University, where he became the chair of the Department of Surgery. His accomplishments are way too numerous to, uh, to count or to list right now, but um, we, I, I mean, it's a pleasure to have you, and thank you so much for your time and audience. So with that, I would like to start a few questions. Can you tell us why you decided to specialize in cardiothoracic surgery? Not sure, but, but uh, I like physiology, cardiovascular physiology as, uh, as a medical student. And um, one of the things about the um, physiology, the cardiovascular physiology that is nearest to physics, it obeys somewhat the principles of physics, which was one of my best subjects in school. So after doing surgery, then that's why I chose to yep. subspecialize. So following training, you returned to Nairobi and you restarted the cardiac surgery program. And having gone through the process of restarting our cardi cardiac surgery program at our VA system, I can imagine, I can only imagine how challenging that was. Can you tell me a little bit about your, the experience that you had restarting the, the, the cardiac program? The, the cardiac program there had story. Uh, when I returned, there was also another colleague who had returned from the United States, and other people were there. We sat together and uh, decided that we were going to offer a service for which there's great need. But then we had to go through a process. That process included raising money to repair the equipment that we required to do open heart surgery. That took us, as a group, to go and see the president of the country, uh, who met with us and did give us some money that we required to be able to start the program. And when we were ready, there, there were many challenges. When we were ready and we had decided that we were going to operate, in fact, I decided I was going to do a patient with an ASD. We met another uh, uphill task in the sense that there was reluctance of uh, some people. People didn't trust us. And they persuaded that child not to go for surgery. However, there was another child whose mother had brought to the clinic about two months before. I left the child with me and said, if my child died before surgery, let me come. If you are able to operate, then operate. But she wasn't taking the child home. So we called the father. He arrived in the morning of the surgery and we went through the whole process and told him that this hospital had not done surgery for about three or four years, open heart surgery. But we were sure that we were able to do it we'll be able to operate um, and this child safely. And uh, he said something very touching. He said, God gives and God takes. And he signed the consent. So then we started the program by doing that child. What a great way to start, right? That was like the best story and best first case to be honest, right? Um, well, so then after that, you moved to Eldoret and you joined Antarich. You raised a lot of funds to build a brand new OR suite and then expanded it even more, right? And now, more recently, you're building a cardiac surgery program here. Can you discuss the needs of having a cardiac surgery program that's not too far away from Nairobi, right? And then 
the obstacles that you've faced in wanting to build a cardiac surgery program since you've been wanting to do this since 1992? New medical school. The facilities were very poor. So we had to find a way of improving the situation. We had a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion with a lot of people. We had some student address and all that. Um, but for the theaters, uh, the issue is there was one operating room and there was always competition of operating. Mm -hmm. And priority was normally given to obstetrics. So patients didn't get to be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for a long time, we, uh, you know, the following year, three or four years, we're now thinking about how to get money mm -hmm. to build another operating space so we can have more operating theater. Um, but what happened in the process, uh, I think this is interesting, I'll bring it in here. What happened in the process is that we had uh, the, the John Mamlin was the leader of um, IU collaboration, more university on the ground and he talking with him um, he helped us find David Martin at that time the department was facing other challenges like not being able to attract anybody to come here at all but from that connection uh, somebody from David's church came here he didn't find me on the first occasion, but the, the discussion was about teaching orthopedics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, that's okay. He was chairing the orthopedics overseas in the United States. He was going to bring somebody here, but those surgeons would not be able to operate. So he decided, it, we, we had a discussion mm -hmm. and he said, look, if I give you, how much money do I give you mm -hmm. to do that? It's another operating space. And he gave us some money. At that time, an equivalent of uh, two million Kenya shillings. It was a lot of money mm -hmm. in the 90s. Um, but what he then did was to design the theater as it is now, the operating rooms as they are now, and showed it to him and said, we will build this one with the money they're given us. And I said, no, you start the whole, uh, uh, the whole, and then we will see what to do. So he kept on raising the money. But in the process, David Matthews joined us. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, we asked him to spearhead that process. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then together we built that operating room. It was greatly required here because the space was very little and the number of patients mm -hmm. were many. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the cardiac program, from that time on, we discussed uh, and I had said that we will do uh, cardiac surgery in this hospital before I retire. Not just because it's exotic, but we sent patients to Nairobi many times and they were given like two years later and two years later they're not there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it had been for a long time my desire that we must start a career program in this part of the country. Yeah. It had been my view in the 80s that we needed to have about six or seven cardiothoracic units mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. At least six uh, some of them will just do thoracic work mm -hmm. and if we had two or three centers in the country doing cardiac work then they could become referral mm -hmm. and become centers of excellence mm -hmm. so i was still pursuing the uh, sale and that's how then we started working uh, on doing cardiac surgery here and then the hospital administration became very key mm -hmm. they actually got in touch with Metronic. Yeah. 
and discuss how to get a farm and how we can do this and all that and it was agreed but it took us a long time part of the time I was not here but uh, while I was away I was discussing with the hospital CEO and we agreed that I should return and try to organize which, which I did and I came back and we organized with the other people again when you're starting a new program there's a lot of resistance some people don't trust what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Some people feel you're going to experiment. Yeah. But eventually you got there. Yes, you did. Now you mentioned genothoracic surgery, which you practice also. Um, I've heard quite a few really interesting and fun stories, actually. Do you mind sharing some of them? If you would, um, can you share how you would approach the, in, the ingestion of, um, or the accidental swallowing of, of airway forward bodies, especially since there were really, at the time, weren't any bronchoscopies to help locate the, uh, the whatever it was that was swallowed. We, we had a challenge because once I was here, um, then a lot of people started asking and sending patients to us. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's nothing we can do. We couldn't do because we didn't have bronchoscopes. Mm -hmm. So I decided that we see the patients and the ambulance takes them to Nairobi. But in the process, we lost one or two children. So I decided to do a different thing. I decided that if we could locate where the foreign body was, then we would do thoracotomy and take it out. Do bronchotomy and take out the foreign body. And we started doing that. Now, whereas we could get a chest x-ray, but you know, most of the foreign bodies are not radiolucent, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't see them. Mm -hmm. And the only way to locate them then was by examining the patient, you know, and listening. Sometimes uh, it will be difficult because it will be sitting in the trachea mm -hmm. and blocking both uh, bronchi mm -hmm. intermittently. Um, in which case, I would go on the right. Mm -hmm. I would error going on the right or going on the left. Time we got, we, got, we, got, we got to try. Mm -hmm. And then we just open chest. Yeah. Open. Yes. Yeah, take out the foreign body and still. So, there are many children we have, we have done. And, and uh, uh, when I think about it, I would do it again if, mm -hmm. if I was in that position. Excellent. Now, you also did pulmonary resections before pulmonary function tests preoperatively pre were even um, available. How did you assess whether or not they could tolerate a lung resection? And uh, it came out, this story said, before all these things were done, people decided the, the reserve, the pulmonary, the lung reserve by blowing mm -hmm. a, a candle. Mm -hmm. So they said, you put a matchstick mm -hmm. about one meter from the patient and he's able to blow it. Uh -huh. Then he will okay. break, <laughs> even if you did the monectomy on them. One meter is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> How about um, esophageal cancer? Can you discuss the prevalence of esophageal cancer in the Eastern and Western Rift Valley? You see, esophageal cancer is uh, a major problem in this region of the country. Um, the, the Eldoret area wasn't visible previously. Because, but the Western was, because in, in the 40s, there was a, a surgeon in Kisumu who said it was prevalent and he had some idea on how, why, what he thought was causing it. Mm -hmm. When I worked in Nairobi, I didn't see a lot of people from here. But when I came to Eldoret, then we started seeing the patients, particularly when we were able to do something. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something was various things. You know, like putting a celestine tube. Uh, we even uh, use at some point mosobabin tubes, mm -hmm. which are obsolete now, um, and gave the patient the ability to swallow when we're not able to do uh, a, a, a resection. And I think that patients, I think that me as a human being, one of the things, and I dare say, I live for is to eat. Yeah, mm -hmm. and eating is a very important component of people's lives. Yeah. yeah, and 
So what went wrong? And we started seeing very la large numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. To an extent where you easily you could easily get about five in this hospital. Um, we did a few resections. Uh, those did well, but this disease generally comes late. Mm -hmm. Second thing about this disease in this region is that there's a lot of uh, the, there's a belief that once you tell somebody this is a cancer, that if you touch it, it will spread faster. So they will not come. And then there's also a lot of belief in herbal medicine. So sometimes they would come, you would offer them surgery, and they would go and come back. Yeah, and then saying, why don't you do what you said you would do, which of course would not be possible. The other thing that we have done, we have done more now, is um, you know the upper two third ones. Mm -hmm. I would normally give them a gastrostomy mm -hmm. and send them to have radiotherapy in Nairobi, mm -hmm. and if they recanalize, then I will take out the tube. Yeah. Um, um, one of my colleagues is a pathologist. Set up a center like a cancer registry mm -hmm. and in this cancer registry in this hospital mm -hmm. the C esophagus ranges one sometimes two depending when you uh, as far as cancers are concerned um, this has also been uh, uh, picked by the center in Lyon France mm -hmm. um, where they have said we are a hot spot mm. but part of the hot spot is because we cover a very large area so the numbers are fairly high yeah. if, if you don't live here you might not have a clear idea of a, a sort of population that we are covering mm. but yes we are seeing large numbers patients are arriving late what has happened more recently is that the, the endoscopic stents have come mm. which uh, for patients, endoscopic stents have come, uh, chest CT has come, so assessment of patients who yeah. will qualify for exploration mm -hmm. is a little more um, precise, mm -hmm. and you will give them alternative for having a stent. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if, they, if that fails, then we we'll give them a gastrostomy tube. It's an old-fashioned treatment, but I've always used this when required. I came to Elderet first and foremost to meet you, but also to scout out opportunities for the growth of a multidisciplinary thoracic oncology program and to see if we can develop a, a South Joe Cancer Center of Excellence here. What would your vision or hope for the development of such a program be? I think we have an opportunity to do that. What we would need is a lot more communication between the various people dealing uh, uh, with cancer of the esophagus. Mm -hmm. Because we, we, we have, it's not only this hospital that does endoscopies. Mm -hmm. Endoscopies are done by very many people. And it's in the private sector also. In the right? private sector yeah. also. And sometimes the patients come directly for oncology. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's the patient who wants that, who doesn't want to discuss surgery, mm -hmm. they give them the right to do so in a disease of that kind. But I think if we all communicate, sat on the same table, mm -hmm. and planned, and made a program of how we approach that, the patients will benefit. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome again. Oh, <laughs> my pleasure.